So our final speaker of the day, Tatsan Sheikh, who will be talking to us about the use of magnetism and microscopy to investigate iron oxide nanoparticles in the London underground. Thank you, Tatsan. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Um, so I'm going to start this talk by asking a question. How many of you have taken the underground? Lots of you, almost all of you. How many of you wear a mask <laughs> while taking the underground? No one. <laughs> so I'm not gonna hear, I'm not here to scare you off, but <laughs> it might not be good for your health. I, I'm not a health expert, but we'll, you know, we'll probably, if we do more research on it, we might get more conclusive answer on this. But I'm gonna be talking more about the material characterization which we did on the underground samples. So why um, why is this coming like that? Why do we want to study the um, air pollution in the underground? Um, and the reason is basically it's it's an iron rich environment, uh, which means it's ideal for for the uh, for the characterization techniques we use in magnetism, for example, so we can. Uh, kind of constrain the grain size morphology, um, the surface um, oxidation states, stuff like that. Um, previous studies, uh, which have been done by people on outdoor air pollution, have pointed out that, you know, particles which are iron oxide particles, they have potentially been found in the brain. So that's a, uh, that's, um, a TEM image from uh, Barbara Maher's paper in PNAS, where she kind of found uh, magnetite particles in human brains uh, in Mexico. So I'm not saying that you have magnetite in your brains if you're in the underground, but it's possible. <laughs> um, and then, <clears throat> because lots of the uh, the source of these particles have been previously studied by groups at Imperial College, King's College, and they found you know that these are iron rich. So 50 to 60 percent of these are iron oxide particles. Um, and it looks very similar to how a grainware particle would look like just over there. And we were interested in, okay, we need to study this. But this wandering wolf uh, says otherwise. So this is one of the comment uh, from, uh, from the press release she had for the paper, where he thinks that there is no point of us going from Cambridge to London when he already knows it's bad. So it is bad, but the purpose of our study was to kind of tell you more on the material side of it. Okay, so before I delve more into it, I'm just gonna quickly say that we use first order reversal curves, which was one of the um, techniques we used to kind of distinguish the source uh, of um, these pollution particles in platforms, operation, operation uh, train operator cabins, and ticket halls. So uh, people who are not familiar with forks, they're basically partially with rhesus loops. You apply a saturation field, then you apply a reversal field, and then you go back to saturation field in steps. And you kind of then um, simulate that into a different axis, and which is done using fork and L. So um, PM is a word which I, I'm using a lot in today's talk. It is called particulate matter. For people who do not know, um, usually it's a term used in by atmospheric chemists. And uh, the red thing you see over there is a particle which is 10 microns in diameter, in aerodynamic diameter, and PM10 or PM2.5 are some words you might have heard that go with the concentration of PM2.5 in ambient air is, let's say, 20 micrograms per meter cube, or the WHO assigns a limit of like. It shouldn't be more than five micrograms per meter cube. Um, so just as a scale, this is this is um, what we're interested in. But the thing with London Underground is that because the source is so ubiquitous, the traditional monitoring methods might kind of, um, I'd say, overlook or kind of masquerade these very fine particles, which are which dominate that um, that microenvironment. So lots of the um, particles were mostly in the ultra fine, less than 100 nanometer scale. And 
Why um, we use forks? Because forks um, are handy when it comes to distinguishing particles which are less than 100 nanometers. Um, and they are um, basically different fingerprints you can attach to them, which has been previously studied. And the idea was to kind of see these gravimetric samples, which we got from TFL in London. So gravimetric samples are basically they uh, pump air into a filter, there's dust on the filter, and then we study those filters for magnetic stuff. And these are, you know, like the conventional fingerprints you might get. So I'll talk about more in the next slides. Um, yeah, so this is an example of the Oxford Circuit Station. Um, it's a very, it's, it's not, it's not something which is, um, it's very intuitive. So if you look at the, if you look at the mass uh, mini gram per meter cube concentration of, of the, of, of different um, filters, you can see that how the force <coughs> signal is very, um, it gets stronger towards the higher concentration, which means it's more enriched in iron particles, iron oxide particles. But also, if you could see, it's a uh, fingerprint doesn't really change much, which also tells that uh, from the ticket hall or the platforms, uh, the source seems to be similar, but different in concentration. The slight variations could be possibly in the SP component because that's something which we later observed was slightly different in our four fingerprints. So what did we try to do? We basically, um, the paper followed um, a very preliminary, uh, set, not a preliminary study, a very characterized, fully characterized study done by Smith et al. Uh, uh, by uh, at Imperial College. And they kind of, you know, they have very vast chemical analysis of the particles, uh, the composition, chemical composition of particles present in there. And because we are um, magnetics people, I only concentrated on the, the red bit, which is 50 to 60% of the London underground composition. <clears throat> so this is a figure from uh, the paper. Um, so if you see, uh, we basically analyze around 30, 35 samples over different lines in the Piccadilly lines on uh, Oxford, um, uh, Piccadilly line, Northern, uh, Victoria, and uh, Central. So the, the worst older lines. And what you can see here, the key takeaway from here is that um, the blue and the blue, yellow, and black ones are different um, gravimetric samples. So PM4 means particle, it, it kind of takes in particles which are four microns or less. PM10 means it takes in particles 10 microns or less. But what you can see is that even though there's a difference in different uh, size fractionated samples, the forks did not differ as much as in, you can even, you can even argue that even the end member one and two look very similar, right? But there is a slight difference in the SP component, which we kind of, uh, figured out using low temperature forks, which we did. Um, so the key takeaway is that the source of these particles are coming from the brake wheel track uh, component system of the tube. Um, another thing which uh, we did was to do high temperature susceptibility measurements. So previously, iron oxide in London Underground has been assigned as being magnetite or iron oxide. But I think lots of studies, and it's very important to have know the composition as well as the grain size. So we, um, through our high temperature susceptibility study, we, you know, we observed that there was, you know, a, temper a, a drop in susceptibility around between 206 and 460 degrees, <clears throat> which is associated with the um, diagnostic of magnemite conversion to hematite. And even if you look at our, our um, the low temperature SIR and graphs or the ZFC FC graphs over here, you do not see any 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 evidence of Fourier transition, which is usually linked to magnetite. Or if there's a dampened Fourier transition, it's linked to surface oxidized 
uh, magnetite as well. We, we didn't see any of that. We've seen it before in our previous pollution samples and roadside some um, filters, but we did not see that here. So then we went on to do some microscopy. Um, this is an image from uh, taken on the TEM. And what you can see is that if you look at figure number eight, you can see how there are these particles which are actually five to 10 nanometers in size, which behave super paramagnetically, which should you know, behave super paramagnetically, but they were usually clustered uh, in like these big agglomerates of micron and two micron sometimes. So the idea is that these particles, if they're big enough, they can, you know, in traditional monitoring methods, they might be aggregated, fractionated wrongly. And it's also possible that for health reasons, if you inhale something this big, it's actually consisting of like hundreds and thousands of nanoparticles and they get, get de-agglomerated in your bloodstream. We don't know, as in I don't know, but it's, it's possible. Um, then we did some tomography uh, to kind of, we did basically everything we could to, to characterize this. So if you look at the tomography results, they were very consistent with our TM. But one thing which we found was that you do also see that uh, different, um, different morphologies, and you also see some of them had different axial ratios. Some of them were slightly elongated, like this particle over there. But most of them were spherical. Some were like elongated, like this one. So um, further work, what we um, basically um, have done, some of it is TFT modeling. The idea is to kind of um, also see whether our experimental result fits in with, fits in with uh, computational data. So TFT modeling, for those who do not know, is, um, is a technique which was developed by Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Jackson at the uh, IRM. And these measurements were done at the IRM where we are basically, we basically use uh, backfield remnants curves to kind of model the uh, particle volume probability in your sample. Um, so in short, if you see this diagram, it's a butler energy plot, which is basically you plot your, the length uh, of the longer axis with major axis with the width to length ratio. Um, the red, Red trick is where it's more significant. Uh, it's more, it's, it's uh, basically points at the higher probability of your particle flying in. Uh, this is the distribution mode, which we got the, this one, which is obviously we can't, it's around 130 nanometers, which is slightly higher than what we got from our individual TEM observations. But then again, if you look at these yellow points, gold points, these are our tomography data which kind of is, some of it is here, some of it is all over, uh, but that's the idea. And for the work also involves some micromagnetic simulations for uh, simulating individual macromite particles and how they might be contributing to our fork or species signal. And thanks for listening. That's. Okay. Never read the comments. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> okay, go on. Did you measure anything outside the stations? No. You probably know because clearly this stuff is, is, is actually working, it's presumably coming up through the escalators and ending up in the ticket boards. Presumably, some of it's probably blowing out into the street. Now, it would probably be a nightmare on rattling that from. Everything that's coming into the ticket holes from the cars and craft houses. Yeah, I think yeah, we we did not have samples from the outside, but yeah, there must be even the ticket hall signal. There might be some exchange there from outside. So, yeah. and I guess the follow-up question, because you went for the older and crappier lines, um, would you expect it to be very different if you were to say look at the Elizabeth line or yeah? Um, I think the Elizabeth line has, so, so one of the key takeaways from our kind of paper was also because uh, these older lines are much deeper, uh, which means they have poor ventilation. And also these particles 
we kind of hypothesize our old age particles, which can, which get resuspended, and that's why they're oxidized over time. As you know, originally they might be magnetite, and now they have turned into magnemite. So it's lines such as Elizabeth line, which is better ventilated, which has better train, and are not as old, uh, would not have these concentrations. Um, yeah. well, we, I think we've asked them. We've asked GML, for example, but I. I doubt they would be this bad. <laughs> I was just wondering how you actually did the sampling. So you're looking at air or particles, right? So you left the filter there for time, so what collected on it? Or like how long did you have to, what was the actual setup? Yeah, so the basically, the gravimetric sampling basically involved that you have an instrument with subsaharan and there is a filter in it. So you kept uh, basically these samples at different locations on the platform, ticket box, and the operator patterns. So you run it for, they were ran for four hours and then they were time averaged for eight hours. These are not over 24 hour measurements. So even with four hour uh, exposure, if you're getting a thousand microgram particles per meter cube on it. That's for context. That's like uh, I don't know, 30, uh, 30, I don't know, three, 30, 40 times more than what London background levels are. So it's just that we don't know if this is as toxic as the cocktail of emissions you get from vehicular emissions, for exhaust and non-exhaust emissions. So, I, um, I had a question that's, that's maybe a little bit out there, but um, I'm just kind of interested because I, I was reading about this. Um, so, so last year, in about March, um, there was, I think, a big something that was quite controversial that came out. It was looking at the, the research into amyloid plaques, which are sort of what people have, have been talking about with the association with these uh, magnetites in people's brains, particularly marijuana. And it sort of seemed to suggest that um, most of the original research on the tying of Alzheimer's to amyloid plaques as it was completely irreproducible and actually may have been falsified. <laughs> um, so, I'm, so, so, so this is not something to denigrate people's research in this area, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting question. Has there sort of, from the environmental magnetism community, has there sort of been a change in the way that people approach sort of justifying um, this stuff just because maybe the, the health concerns that are there, which probably still are there, um, have kind of changed in that as As in, do I add something to that? That's, that's more like a comment. I think, yeah, no, I guess that the, 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 the health impacts of these iron oxide specifically are really interesting. So we're talking to toxicology across the street um, who are very interested in, in, in that question. So it's not, and I think, yeah, the amyloid plaque is, is one thing that's a very specific thing with the brain and Alzheimer's, but uh, I think the mechanism of interaction is around these sort of reactive ops, you know, generation of free radicals and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, because it's been quite oxidative stress, not down to their cells. Yeah, so yeah. I guess it's just kind of all, I mean, magnetite and oxide are inherently toxic. This is why NTB, they can survive because they have the uh, membrane, membrane bound to the ribosome, so they're not in contact with biological cells. So as soon as you have magnetite free within a uh, biological system, it will start killing off that system. So, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's how it is. <laughs> This is why daily tests don't work. <laughs> Too much magnetism. <laughs> That's a good note to end up. Too much magnetism, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>